morning. Um, it gives me such great pleasure, uh, first, to welcome you to the to George Washington School of Business. More generally, to welcome you to George Washington University. Um, it's wonderful to have you here because this kind of event is really the lifeblood of the exciting things that universities do. Um, it's also wonderful for me to, to welcome you to the inaugural event of what I hope is a very long partnership between the George Washington School of Business and the Luxury Lab Think Tank, which in my view is fast becoming one of the most innovative organizations in thinking, in, in thinking about innovation, social change, the digital landscape, all of the things that are important for how businesses, organizations, whether in the public or private sector, run today. Um, I want to give you a couple of, uh, of insights or thoughts about why I came to the George Washington School of Business. Scott and I actually um, were colleagues at Stern before I came here at the NYU Stern School of Business. Um, and you know, I was fairly comfortable there. But it always seemed to me that there was really a deep problem that was troubling business schools around the world. And that problem actually, I think, started in 1970 when Milton Friedman uh, launched his clarion call in the New York Times Magazine about the launch of shareholder value. Shareholder capitalism was all that we really needed to think about because it didn't make sense to have businesses or organizations were generally thinking about the complex world of stakeholders. You just needed to think about how to maximize your potential and maximize your shareholder value. And unfortunately, in my view, business schools sort of followed neoclassical economics down that rabbit hole. They actually really began to shed all of their engagement with the social and public sectors. They really began to push away ideas about engagement with states, engagement with governmental organizations. We think about them sometimes in business schools, but we generally think them about them as externalities in markets. We don't think aggressively about how to actually understand the ways in which Business is fundamentally a social and political process. Business organizations are fundamentally embedded in and shaped by the social and political organizations and institutions that they are a part of. And so I wanted to come here to the business school and actually build that kind of organization. I wanted to build an organization that was fundamentally about an engagement with the public sphere, that was fundamentally about the social and political consequences of what it is that we do. Uh, and as it came up, what better opportunity than to do that six blocks from the White House of the nation's capital of, of the largest economy in the world? What better place to do it than across the street from the IMF and the World Bank and the IFC and uh, uh, not far away from many of the other most powerful public institutions that we're a part of? Uh, and so that was sort of the vision of coming here. And this partnership with the Luxury Lab Think Tank is, is about helping us to think about doing that. Now, it's a very interesting moment that we live in today. So this is the, everybody knows the name Mark Zuckerberg, and we live in the world of Facebook and Twitter and uh, all of the other things that actually have reshaped our social sphere right now. But as a sociologist, um, I'd like to take a step back just for a second uh, and reflect a little bit more uh, about where some of these ideas come from. So. Mark Zuckerberg has come onto the scene in the last five to seven years. Uh, Twitter, relatively new phenomenon. Even the internet, in terms of its commercial app applicability, only goes back to 1996. Uh, but actually, if we start to think about how deeply these issues of the social structure and the social embeddedness of the world that we live in go back, probably we'd have to start that conversation in 1967, when a guy named Stanley Milgram first wrote about the small world problem. I'm sure everybody's heard the term six degrees of separation. That actually came from Stanley Milgram's insightful study in 1967 in which he looked at people in Omaha and Boston and tried to figure out how long it would take to get to any part of the social sphere and the social structure. More recently, I think a lot of people have come uh, onto these ideas through the popularization of, of David Fisher's work by Malcolm Gladwell. I'm sure if you read The Tipping Point, you've heard about the ride of Paul Revere and the angst of William Dawes because he was never as famous as Paul Revere. And Fisher's uh, very interesting insight within that is that, well, Dawes' family always thought that he was short shrifted because his name wasn't as exciting as Revere. Somehow it was just the Paul Revere name resonated in the public consciousness. 
But the real answer, actually, that Fisher uncovers is that Paul Revere had a very different type of social network structure. Paul Revere was actually networked across, he was what we call in, in the sociological literature, a broker. He was somebody who was connected to many different organizations and in many different groups. And he actually had an embeddedness in the public sphere that gave him much more resonance. People listened to his voice much more and were engaged much more with what he had to say. So when he and Dawes did the same ride in a little bit of different directions, it just happened to be the case that they remembered him a little bit better because of his social embeddedness, because of his network. So where does that leave us today? So here we are sitting in Washington and thinking about how organizations are reaching out to their populations. Well, of course, we have to be able to think about this from the perspective of the digital landscape. And we have to be able to think about this from the exciting moment that we sit in. We sit in this moment in which the world is so rapidly changing. We sit in this moment in which there's a transformative set of ideas that are going on and the world is moving so fast. We're more global than we've ever been. We're more connected than we've ever been. But what does it actually mean for the public institutions? Because make no mistake about it, it is fundamentally a question of democracy. It's fundamentally a question of what does it mean for the constituents of the world that we actually are sitting in a moment in which the very way that people are connected with the agendas of the public sphere are changing. Now, this moment is actually a really interesting one, not just because of the changing digital landscape, but it's also an important moment because of where we sit in the global economy today. We're the largest economy in the world. We're indisputably the most dominant uh, economic and military superpower. Uh, but we're also in a moment of crisis. We're in a moment in which we are struggling. We're in a deep recession. Innovation is coming, but is it going to come soon enough to actually shift, the, move the needle in terms of the dynamics of our global economic situation? Uh, maybe democracy is even breaking down a little bit. The shiny city on the hill maybe is losing its luster. But we stand at this moment also of a dramatically changing digital landscape that I actually think uh, and have learned much from the Luxury Lab uh, is actually changing the game in terms of thinking about what democratic principles mean and thinking about what social engagement means. Uh, so I feel very lucky at the, 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 the George Washington School of Business that we've actually been able to form a partnership with, with L2 uh, and being able to learn some of, of, of these issues. Uh, and I hope to learn from continue to learn from them and learn from all of you uh, in terms of uh, how people are thinking about these types of issues. Uh, so I hope everybody's excited about that agenda for today. Um, and uh, enjoy the ride. Turn it back over to Scott.